Hey, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Hey, we, we um, just, just to go to the fir- first slide here, um, here's, this, is, this is just kind of my goal for every single person that attends this house, that you would know his word, that you would hear his voice, and that you would, that you would do his will in your life. Okay, just as a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's, it's very easy. If you're, if you're new with us, um, that, that's, that's my agenda for your life. I, I really want that in your life. I, I want you to know him. I want you to know his word. I want you to be able to hear his voice. And I want you to be able to do his will in your life. And uh, we're going to do all that we can in this house to make sure that happens. And one of the ways that we make sure that happens is that we, um, this morning, we're going to be talking about depression. And uh, we, we started it last week, and, and I shared with you guys that um, I, I suffered with depression for about two years and was in the shadow of it for about eight more years coming in and out of it. And, you know, it was very private stuff. Didn't really tell many people what was going on. And so I'm familiar with it. And at the same time, I, it was hard because nobody gave me any good advice, like when I had it. You know, they either said, you know, go get counseling, take this medication, um, or uh, talk. Let, let's just talk about it. And there's um, – the only problem is, is, is that I, I want to know truth, on, and I believe that the Bible has truth in it, and I want to know what God says about it, you know, and I, I, want, I want his help with it. So if there's anybody of you guys here today who suffers with depression, good news, we're going to be talking about it all day. Also, you guys are equipped to be ministers, and you guys need to help people with depression. You guys hear what I'm saying? So if you're here and you're like, well, this doesn't, this doesn't apply to me. Absolutely it does. I can't tell you how many people are suffering from depression now, um, and I'm sure you guys know a few. And I know that sometimes that it might be difficult. But people, what, what you really need is you really need the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you when there's open doors telling you what to say. Because when God's telling you what to say and, and helping you along and giving you the moments when it needs to happen, it, the person's going to be helped. So just this morning, um, last week we had talked about what is depression. And depression is actually a collection of symptoms. Okay? So there's not a, a, uh, a virus bug that's labeled depression. Depression is actually a collection of symptoms. And if we're dealing with symptoms, we're dealing with something other than depression in a way. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So when we say the word depression, all this, it feels like you're getting hit with a Mack truck, right? When you say, let's look at these symptoms, you're dealing with tricycles. And I'd rather deal with tricycles than a Mack truck. Make sense? And so when you look up here, feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, loss of interest in daily activity, appetite or weight change, Sleep change, anger or irritability. Have you guys ever, has anybody ever suffered from these? Loss of energy, self-loathing, reckless behavior, concentration problems, unexplained aches and pains. Have you guys ever had those, those type symptoms? Okay. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, it's a real thing, and I just want to just talk to you about maybe what the, how the Bible would counsel us. How many of you guys have ever had these thoughts before? You are all alone. You are a burden on the people around you. You're never going to feel better. No one cares about you. The world would be better off without you, Right? What's so funny is that the nature of these things are actually accusations, okay? And as a Christian, you have to decide very early on what you believe about the enemy, about the devil, about the accuser, whether or not he's real, what he can do, and what he can't do. And oftentimes, we often say, well, you know, I'm not going to blame it on the devil. Well, every word that I say and everything I do, I take full responsibility for. But I got to tell you, I, I figured out that not every thought is my own and not every feeling is my own, Right? But see, here's the thing. If you don't believe that, you have to put on those thoughts and feelings every day and wear them as your identity, which stinks. Meanwhile, the enemy is actually sending you those thoughts and feelings. And if you don't, if you don't come to grips with this fact, you have to put on depression because you feel depressed. Then the goal becomes to not be depressed. How many of you guys can control how you feel? Anybody? Anybody? If I could choose to never wipe the smile off my face, I would choose that, you know? I smile a lot. Um, but these, these feelings that come, the people who have them would choose not to have them, right? But the, here's the tricky thing. How many of you guys know that the Bible talks about the flesh? The flesh doesn't actually mind being depressed. It wants to justify why the depression's there. So your flesh isn't really helping you. So your flesh feels depressed, and it feels this thing, and the flesh just wants to feel what it feels. And the soul or the, or, or the, the, the mind comes in there and tries to justify why the depression is there. Once that starts to happen, 
things begin to take place in someone's life in which they begin to concrete a place for depression to stay. And at the same time, how many of you guys know that the world is offering advice around depression that isn't actually helping? What I mean by that is this. I, I'm a Christian here on earth, and my responsibility is to be on fire, passionate for God, doing the will of God on the earth, right? And so if that's not happening, I probably need some help. The world says, if we can get rid of these symptoms, then you're fine, which isn't true. You can get rid of these symptoms, still not be on fire, passionately doing the will of God on the earth, and you're still not fine. You still got to get there. You guys hear what I'm saying? So counseling actually comes up short in which they're trying to get rid of symptoms. And we've become a symptom-driven society in which symptoms are the big deal. And if you have symptoms, then it's wrong, and we need to get you, get you help. How many of you guys know that you can have those symptoms that we showed and still be okay, still show up at church and still do the will of God, still hear the God's voice and try to do what he wants you to do on the earth? You guys understand that? I don't have to be a slave to my symptoms. Now, if I could choose to make them go away, would I? Absolutely. But what if they're there, but I still got to choose how I was going to behave and what I was going to say? What if the goal actually wasn't to get rid of depression, but it was to live your life for him regardless of it? Wouldn't that be cool? That's actually a doable goal. But if the goal becomes I got to get rid of depression, well, are they going to write the right red medication? Is there a medication they invented to get rid of it? Is there a, some sort of form of counseling to get rid of it? Well, what actually perpetuates depression is the fact that it doesn't go away and then it begins to affect how we live and what we say. Right? When, uh, when my older brother died when I was 16, this was the goal of the world around me, was to get me to talk about it, okay? And, there's, and then we think about that, and it's like, yeah, you know, you need to get it out. And there was a grieving process. And there were the six stages to the grieving process, and, and, the, and the, we, were, we were trying to figure out, trying to get me through this process. What if, just what if, God is real, right? And what if I'm not actually in denial, I'm actually okay in my heart, and what if I don't actually need to talk about it because me and God talk about it all the time? I'm not against talking about things, but what I'm saying is I'd, I'd much rather have you talk to God first because he told you to cast all your anxiety on him, not a counselor. So if you're not doing that first, biblically, you're off. You guys hear what I'm saying? It says cast all your anxieties on me because I care for you. He's proven that, right? Right? And so there's something about missing biblical principles in the midst of depression that if we don't do them, we don't get the benefit from them. How many of you guys want to benefit from the Bible? I'd like to. And I'd like to do what it says so that I could do, become who he made me to be. So what ended up happening is when my older brother died, that's what kind of spurred on this depression, is people said, well, if we can just get him to talk about it, then... Um, he'll be better. And what ended up happening was I would go to people and they said, they said, here, this person lost his brother at an early age. You know what his advice was? It never goes away. The, this is what they said. They said, the pain never goes away. Well, there goes hope. What? You're still suffering? Yeah, man, this is just the way it is. And what happens? A stronghold gets built based on someone else's experience. But I don't want strongholds based on someone else's experience. I want to know the word. And I, I want these strongholds of the word of God in my mind, and these other ones will not tear it down. But I was young. I didn't know. I didn't know there was an enemy that was coming to kill, uh, just destroy me. And I didn't understand that, so I was destroyed. And I just let people build strongholds in my mind that made sure that I had to suffer from depression for the next 10 years. Ugh. Good news, you don't have to do that. Right? Because here's what I didn't get. I didn't get that I could actually... Uh, began to excel even though I was feeling depression. I didn't know that I could actually let depression work for me instead of me working for depression. I didn't, I didn't realize that, that depression is simply the way the enemy gets to take you down because he knows how productive and how awesome and how incredible you are, and he doesn't want you to realize it, so he begins to make you feel a certain way so he can say certain things to you. A lot of these things he says are you statements. If you guys ever have a you statement, don't believe it. It's just an accusation. Don't make you statements towards other people. It's just an accusation. And that is what he tries to do. And so here's the thing. 
And this is such good news. Um, let's just say that, um, I, I'm going to read this verse, and then I'll teach you how to, guys how to do it. It says, what does the Bible prescribe? The Bible says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Okay? A lot of people don't know how to guard, um, guard your heart. I, I had this awesome experience. When I first was baptized in the Holy Spirit, for the first year, I had this, this gift of discernment where if somebody told me something about the Spirit that wasn't true, an alarm went off in my head. It would go, womp, womp, womp. And I would be listening to somebody, and they'd be, if they said something that wasn't true, this alarm would go off, and I would guard my heart against what they were saying right? If you don't know the word, you can't guard your heart against the lies of the world, the lies of the enemy, and the flesh. You just have to succumb to it. Isn't that good that we're doing a Bible study? And that you can come to that Bible study study and understand the word and get it in your heart. Because the most important thing that you understand, according to scripture, is what you're worth to him and the price that he paid for you. How many of you guys know that he he didn't die so that you could succumb to depression and so that that you could live your life in a depressed state waiting to go to heaven. He didn't do that. And I think we understand that. And I don't think anybody in here chooses depression. Even though sometimes it might feel that way when people will just begin to... Have you guys ever been depressed and people begin to like stop calling you because they don't feel like dealing with it? Right? That only adds to it. And and all of a sudden, like... Your feelings come, then your thoughts come, accusations come, and then the circumstances around you begin to reflect everything that the enemy is saying. Have you guys ever, ever had a thought in your mind and then maybe your spouse or someone close to you echoed the same accusation? Stuff's not by accident. It's very real. And if you can't guard your heart, for example, if someone says you can never do anything right, you can, like, how many of you guys know that's not true? And, and it's okay to, like, um, depending on the situation, to say out loud, uh, if that person's not around or whatever, actually, that's not true. I can do things right. And when me and God work on things together, impossible things move. You guys understand what I'm saying? But see, the problem is, is that we don't guard our heart. I shared this story the other day. I'll share it with you guys now. I, I, um, depression came back, and it, it knocked on me about a year and a half ago, okay? And um, I'm the pastor of this church, and I was praying one day because I just felt this thing just come, and it just grabbed my shoulders, began to squeeze it, and this feeling of this old depression came. And you know what thought came to my mind? Listen to this. You've suppressed everything. How crazy is that? You've suppressed everything and, this, and it's come back. And you're going to have to really deal with it now. And you know what I could have done in that moment? If I wasn't guarding my heart, I could have said, oh man, what am I suppressing? I better go back and look. The moment you go back and look is the moment it's going to have more to say about what you're looking at. How many of you guys uh, didn't have a perfect life growing up? Yeah. Here's an idea. Let's go back and investigate and figure out what was wrong in the people's lives around us, and maybe it'll make us feel better. No. It doesn't. How many of you guys know that pain revisited isn't helpful? The cross revisited is very helpful. Oh, thank God that happened. Yeah, that happened to me, but thank God God did that. That person's forgiven. And he died so I wouldn't have to keep my shoes in that mess anymore. His grace comes and he picks me up and I don't have to live like that anymore. That stuff doesn't have to affect me. Yeah, I was abused when I was young, but Christ was abused for me. Thank God I have that perspective and I live from that perspective and I don't have to look back at what took place, but I can look at him and know that I'm okay because of what he went through. That he has plans for me. And they're to prosper me, not for me to suffer from depression. Did you guys ever see some of these verses, rejoice in all things? Some people hear that and like we sing that and we're like, we're rejoicing. And it's, it's, let me just tell you this. The fact that he said it is a fact that it can be done and that brings me great comfort. The fact that he commanded it, there's actually a grace attached to the command that if we would be open to it and actually repent. And people, I don't think people still understand repentance. And that's all counseling is to me. Is there's verses you're not believing and if we repent and humble ourselves, God's grace will come and lift us up. 
And so you, you can come to me and you can say, man, I lost my job. Um, I, I, my, my spouse left me. And my circumstances are crushing me. And I, this is what I would say to you. I'd say, I understand. I'd listen to you. You know, and I'd say, man, that, that stuff sounds really hard. But I just want to just, just remind you of a few things the Bible says. The Bible says this. He says that he would never abandon you. He says that he has plans for you. He says that if you would believe in him, that he would move things. Will you, and, and maybe in the midst of what took place, you lost sight of his promises. Let me just ask you something now. In the midst of these circumstances, which one do you want to look at? Do you want to look at the word or do you want to look at the circumstances? I'll say, I want to look at the word. And I said, well, will you repent with me right now? And will you just say, hey, Father, I lost sight of what you said. I began to believe these circumstances instead of your word. Will you come and help me? Boom. And he just bum rushes the person. Because that's all the Father's waiting for. It's for us to see it the way he sees it so that he can come and give us grace and lift us out of it. I mentioned last week that a lot of these verses have conditions on them, and you bet they do. Just because the Bible says something doesn't mean you benefit from it. Seek the kingdom first, and all these things will be added unto you. All these things will not be added unto you unless you seek the kingdom first. He says he'll give you the desires of your heart, but you have to rejoice in him. And, and there's a lot of promises. And, and ask anything in my name, and in that day you will ask no questions. That, that whole chapter in the upper room is a very mature Christian if you read the surrounding context of the, of the promises that he's making. I still have questions. And not every prayer I, I, I ask is answered. I still have more growing to do. But listen to this. Anybody, will you, um, will somebody in here make up a, a circumstance that usually starts depression? Stan, can you make one up? Okay, you lost your job, Right? And so, this is what the Bible says. It says, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. The Bible says that. So when I tell you that your struggle is not actually with circumstances or your feelings or your thought, it's actually with the enemy and what he's saying, the Bible agrees with me. Isn't that good? That I, this isn't just like a, uh, a self-help seminar? And this is my advice to you. The Bible agrees with what I'm saying. And I, but I got all this stuff from the Bible. I didn't make this up. And now I'm happening to find it. Like, this is what the Bible says. And it talks about the schemes of the enemy. Do you know how easy it is to foil a scheme when you know what the scheme is? If you know some people are going to rob a bank, you know which bank it is, you know what night it's on, and you know what time, put four men in there with shotguns. It's not, it's, that's the easiest, you can foil it. But the problem with the scheme is, if you don't know what the scheme is, it's going to get you. And, and Christians get got all the time when it comes to this thing. Because they refuse to believe the scheme. And what's the scheme? It's not, it's not outside of your own thoughts and your own feelings. But the majority of Christians believe that their thoughts are their thoughts, their feelings are their feelings, and they keep asking the question, what's wrong with me? Why do I feel this way? Because Satan's a jerk. Because he's firing arrows, and you're unaware that he's doing it, so you can't even put up a shield of faith because you think those arrows are you. Meanwhile, they came from him. Why, why do I still struggle with lust? Because you don't believe that you've been made righteous, so when lust comes and knocks on the door and says, are you home, you just let it in because you feel like it's you because you had a thought or a feeling? You've been made righteous now, right? But if you actually believe that any thought or feeling that is not righteous, you would guard your heart against and say, that's so funny. That used to be me. That's not me anymore. So the evidence that you believe that is you standing firm. And everything you don't stand firm against, you don't get to guard your heart against. And then the wellspring of life is affected. You guys get what I'm saying? So you can sit there and you can lose your job, right? And you can lose your job and then all of a sudden, like, you don't know what you're going to do because people count on you, right? And on the way home, this, you can't do anything right. This always happens. Meanwhile, the testimony of God in your life is not being reminded to you at that time. Every time God has shown up and delivered you, it's not what you're thinking about. You've decided not to do that with your mouth. You've decided not to do this. 
Father, I glorify you. I just lost my job. That doesn't matter. You've provided every single time in my life. You've always made sure there was enough. And I thank you. I thank you that I am saved. I thank you that I am delivered. I thank you that you are my friend. I thank you that you are in the car now. This has not missed your sight. You know that I've lost a job, and you say that you have plans for me. And I thank you that I will not let this shape me one bit. Right? But instead of doing that, watch this. Because you're just unaware. You didn't know you could do that. You never do anything right. This always happens to you. This isn't fair. What's my wife going to say? What are my kids going to eat? And then all of a sudden, your mind just starts to spin with questions, and then all of a sudden, a feeling gets shot. And this, this, this feeling is anger. This feeling is depression. It's sorrow for yourself. Meanwhile, he, he was beaten beyond recognition, and that means very little to you at the moment, right? Because it's, it's what's being done to you and how unfair this is, even though the biggest injustice in the world was a man hung on a cross who was innocent, right? And instead of glorifying him, you get caught up in your perspective of just seeing what's taken place to you. And all of a sudden you get home and, and, and your, your spouse says, just says the same things the enemy say because he's got a microphone, right? You never do anything right. What's our family going to do? What are our kids going to eat? Right? And then instead of, of, of being the, the pillar, right? You just, in the family, as the head of the family, as the man, you spout off, you should have got a job. You should be working. This wouldn't have happened if you would have let me get this out. And accusations just begin to go. Right? And now your marriage is in is in hell. You've lost your job. And you don't know what's going on and you wonder where God is. And, and then now you start praying like this, God, give me a job, give me a job, give me a job. Instead of this, God, give me the grace to rise above the situation and live as if I trust you. I don't know what it looks like. I know that you have plans and I trust those plans. But as of right now, I thank you for the way that I'm walking this thing out. I thank you that you've always provided. And Lord, I wanna live from that place of trusting you. Because there's not moments, there's not very many moments like this where I get to glorify you in perseverance. Where I believe you in the midst of something hard happening. When Satan comes and squeezes me, that you would be squeezed out of me and that he would not separate the promise from my faith. This glorifies you and I thank you for the opportunity. Right? I'm, I'm telling you, and I've seen it. I've seen people in this congregation believe God in the midst of horrible circumstances. I've seen him um, believe it in the midst of uh, spouses leaving. I've seen it in the midst of people dying. I, I've seen people stand firm. And then I've seen the world say, you're suppressing it. Meanwhile, they, they believe God. I was talking to you about how I, I was a pastor and I was, I was feeling this depression and, and this, this, this cloud, and I prayed. And um, I hope this doesn't sound too spiritual or too over your head. I don't get visions very often. I wish I got more. And I wish they were on demand and, you know, one day that would be great. But I saw a vision, an overhead vision, and I was sitting there and there was a cloud next to me, a gray cloud. And this gray cloud was, was, wasn't, wasn't nice. And it was right next to me and I was feeling depression and... I, my wife and I prayed, and, and as we prayed, um, we just thanked God, and it didn't go away. It stayed. The day continued, and it stayed, and I never gave it, gave it a chance to say something because it never put me in the right place to do it. Depression was there, but it didn't matter. I know what depression feels like. Depression was there, but I refused to let it tell me anything about the depression. When it, come in, when it came to say, you're suppressing things. I said, I'm suppressing nothing. Everything that, you're, everything that I could have suppressed died when I came to Christ. And now I'm in Christ. So there's nothing, there's nothing that I'm suppressing. I've left everything at the foot of the cross. If, the, if I have something against somebody, Holy Spirit will tell me. And we'll leave that at the foot of the cross. There's nothing to suppress. I'm telling you, it's fun. Now depression's working for me. Because at that point, then you have to decide what your prayer life's going to be. 
And, and should it increase? Absolutely. You're going to have to decide, are you going to declare the promises of God or declare them less? Absolutely, you're going to declare them more. Are you going to be thankful more or are you going to be thankful less when depression is? Are you going to be thankful more? Because now all he's doing is reminding you of the spiritual battle. It's really easy to not realize you're in a battle when you're back at the base. If you're on the front line, you never forget it because you've got bullets whizzing by you. And when you're suffering from depression, you've got bullets whizzing by you. It's a nice reminder that this is a spiritual battle and you can actually do something about it. And man, when depression comes, like it's actually, it can get actually quite exciting because you can find your prayer life more solid than it's ever been. You can find yourself more closer to God than you've ever been. And it actually gets to the point where if, when it leaves, and it will leave because you're being drawn closer to the Father by it, when it leaves and, 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 uh, and the discipline isn't as tight as it was, you say, man, I wish I was on the front lines again. When I was reminded of it constantly, of my need for God and how good he is and what he's done. So the day went on and I began to praise God and the depression's there and it's not saying much because I'm not giving it much time to talk and um, saying to myself, well, you know, whatever this is, if this is a, a, a spirit of darkness, well, let's teach this thing how to worship. Let's teach this thing how you pray to God, what actual Thanksgiving looks like. And I'm praising Thanksgiving, go doing my own thing, come back. And the thing would squeeze hard, praise him again. Next day it's there, next day it's there, all of a sudden it's Sunday. And I'm like, well, you know, let's, let's teach this thing how to preach. So you come in here, and uh, a congregant met, 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 met me at the front door, and he said this. He goes, I had a dream about you, and he said, Satan was coming to depress you. And I said, he, he's trying, but it's fine. It was four days, you know. That's nothing compared to 10 years in and out of it, right? It's not a big deal. Because I knew, I knew that all it was doing was making me more militant and more certain of my calling and more sure of who God is. After four days, it left because it didn't like how much I was worshiping. It didn't like how thankful I was. And it didn't like that it was drawing me closer to God, so it left. Isn't the cool thing, when the Bible describes the enemy's tactic, he describes a bow and arrow, right? He doesn't describe a dagger. He describes something that's far away, that's firing from far away. Do you know that the, the enemy isn't limitless and he only has a certain amount of arrow, arrows and he wants to make sure they're effective? And if they're not effective against you, don't you think he'll go find someone else? Right? He doesn't have an unending quiver. But if it's working, if it's working, we'll probably call in reinforcements. Let me say that again. If what the enemy's saying and doing in your life is working, he'll probably call in reinforcements because it's a good use of resources. You don't want that in your life. You don't want it to work. You want to draw closer to God because the Bible says submit to God, resist the enemy. When you submit to God, you resist the enemy. How do you submit to God? There's nothing more powerful, I say this all the time, than you telling God what he said and thanking him that you're living from it, and if you're not living from it, asking him for help to live from it. There's nothing more powerful than a father hearing their child say, I want to be like you and do what you say. When, I, when, when uh, Brecken scrapes his knee, I asked him the other day, I said, how many fingers do you have? He said, a lot. Isn't that funny? He's three. I said, man, you're going to be like a lawyer. That's awesome. He scraped his knee the other day, and all I had to do was tell him, you're a big boy, it's okay, stop crying. And he stopped. I wasn't, I wasn't yelling at him. I wasn't saying, you know, making it gruff. I, I was hugging him when I said it. I said, you're a big boy. You don't have to cry. And he didn't, and he did stop. And we just started playing. He didn't, he didn't begin to tell me why his knee hurt why he's justified in crying and all that. I don't mind if my kid cries. Please hear me on that. I'm not over his bed going, be a big boy. <laughs> it's not that. It's, it's, he didn't, he didn't let this, like he listened to his dad more so than his circumstance. He had the evidence. There was skin missing. You know, he could have said, but look, there's skin missing, but you don't understand how I feel, but I'm, I'm in a lot of pain right now. He didn't say any of that. He just listened to his dad. It's beautiful. I'm not telling you, like, you guys need to be perfect when it comes to this stuff. What I'm saying is my, my three-year-old is. 
in that scenario. So I, I, hope, you, I hope you don't hear me. I, I understand what it means to suffer from depression, and I hate it, and I want to crush it with you. I hope you hear me not saying, well, you, like, because you can in your heart say, you don't understand what I've been through. And that's exactly what keeps you there, is that nobody understands what you've been through. I could say the same thing. I could tell you a story, a long one, about what I've been through. But it means very little to me. And I don't, I, I used to, oh, this used to bother me so much. I used to get my identity from it. I wanted people to ask me about it because I had put it on so that I could talk to them about it because it became who I was. I'm much greater than that, and so are you. And it's hard when something hangs around and hangs around for years and years and years for you not to just bring it into who you are. I get that. But let me just read one other verse. Did you ever hear somebody say, you know, be careful with your mouth? You know, as a Christian, be careful of what you say. Um, and it's almost as if you're saying, like, sometimes people are saying, you know, don't, be careful what you say because you could curse yourself. I, I don't mean it like that. What I mean by it is, watch what you're saying because the moment you're saying is the moment you've unguarded your heart and now it's in your heart. Okay? There are some, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. It says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. If you guys are doing this, you're amazing. And you guys need to come and, and help me with this. Because the, James says, if you, can, if you can get this thing right with your mouth, you become perfect. If you become perfect in everything that you speak. And I just want to just continue reading this. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. The Bible's not saying that there's no room for correction. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, is what grieves the Holy Spirit is what actually comes out of our mouth. And if you actually look um, at Galatians 5, 19, 21, it says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. Eight of these sins are sins of the mouth, okay, that are actually spoken. What grieves the Holy Spirit is when we let things come out of our mouth. Have you guys ever had an issue with somebody and you went and told somebody else what your issue was instead of that person? I've never done that, okay? No, I'm joking. I, the Holy Spirit convicts me of that. Is the, moment, the moment I would talk about somebody as if they're not in the room or if I haven't talked to them, and I ask God, I said, God, I hate that. That's, that's of the world. Please help me with that. Because like, sometimes I just go into this mode and I just, just start just sharing, you know? And the world taught us to do that, that we need to, if you get hurt by someone, you need to share that so that you wouldn't, um, they actually, it's actually the opposite. They say share that so that that doesn't get into your heart. And sharing it, you're letting it into your heart. And you can go to God and get all that stuff out. But what grieves the Holy Spirit, because we're supposed to have peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. What grieves the Holy Spirit is what we're saying oftentimes. And when we're, when we're saying things that we shouldn't be saying and the Holy Spirit is grieved, it's very hard to be in touch with that kingdom of the peace, joy, and the righteousness. It's difficult. It's clouded. A veil comes down, right? So when we say something that's not of God and then we feel less of God, it only gets us to act more ungodly because now we have to justify why we feel this way and we share and we share and we share and it becomes a form of entertainment. Meanwhile, God said, cast all your anxiety on me. Let me read this one to you one more time but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. Talking about the prophetic word there, the edification. It's not that one, it's the other one that we were just back at. But only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. How many of you guys would like to hear God's voice all the time telling you exactly what people need to hear so that you can edify them and lift them up? Sound like a good thing? Then you gotta let no unwholesome words come out of your mouth. 
It's a challenge. I'm not saying that, that that's the only way that that can happen, but that's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, let this, let living water flow from your mouth. Because it shouldn't be fresh and salt, right? So if you want to hear God's voice more for the people in your life so you can edify them more, you've got to cut off the one valve. And he'll speak to you more. And the more we speak negatively about one another, the less we're in touch with God, the worse we feel. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And I've done that. What does the world want you to do? Encourage you to speak negative things about one another to get it out. Have you ever said that to somebody? Oh, man, this guy really ticked me off. Oh, well, get it out, brother. The moment you get it out is the moment that it gets in your heart. You guys hear me? And you're just a perfect target for depression. And it's almost like permission is given, permission granted. I just want to just dispel this rumor. If you can go to the isn't it disingenuine uh, slide. I just don't feel like worshiping or giving thanks. And I think sometimes we lift that up and we say, like when we're in worship, we have this idea like, well, I want it to be genuine. I don't want to clap unless it's genuine. I don't want to sing unless it's genuine. I just don't feel like worshiping God today. I'm just going to take a moment to myself and just not worship because I want to be genuine. You guys understand that? I used, I used to think this way. I used to say, I'm not going to go to church today because I don't feel like going to church. I want to be genuine about how I feel and how I'm feeling rules my life. So I'm just going to obey my feelings because it's the right thing to do because it's genuine. I don't feel like going to work today. So I don't think I'm going to because I want to be genuine when I get there. I don't feel like being faithful to my spouse today. I think she would appreciate that because at least I'm genuine. What kind of logic is that? It's ridiculous. But when it comes to things of the Spirit, we almost let that thing fly. As if, as if your Lord was your feelings. The moment you don't feel like worshiping, get up, start clapping your hands. I don't care where you are. Go into a bathroom stall and just go crazy. Start flagging the toilet paper. <laughs> do, do whatever you need to do because your feelings, your feelings are not your God. They're just not. God's your God. And you've got to choose who you're going to obey. And he said, put no other God before me. And everything the world throws at you has to do with you putting your feelings first. I hear people counsel each other all the time. And when I hear them counsel each other in this way, I just want to cry. I could cry right now. People giving people excuse to act a certain way because of something that was done or the way they feel. or I can understand why you feel that way. Meanwhile, because they don't, they, well, I don't want to come down hard on them. They're dying. They're dying. Throw them a rope. Have the courage to say, I understand why you feel that way, but this is what the Bible says, and I guess we're going to have to decide which one we're going to go with. Have the courage to say it. Don't let people die in their sin because you didn't have the courage to correct them. Because that is edification. And don't use the word love as an excuse for it. By the time people get to me often, they've already been counseled 26 other ways. And they're coming to me to check a box just so they can get permission from their pastor to do what they want to do. And every, they, they have an entire fan club that's already backed them up. Meanwhile, what they're doing isn't biblical, and it's going to destroy them. And I care. You guys have no idea how much I care. I care a lot. I care a lot about the people in this church. I care a lot about the decisions you make. I care a lot that you're not deceived. I care a lot. And I don't want to see anybody just be taken out because as a corporately, we didn't have the courage to tell people the truth about it. And so when it comes to being disingenuine, it's disingenuine as a Christian to let your feelings rule your life. That's what it is. And so don't do that. Don't, don't in the name of being genuine, decide that in this realm of the most important facet of your life, 
that feelings are king. Finally, I already went over this a little bit. Let's just look at this last slide here. But scripture doesn't seem to work. His love is unconditional, but promises are conditional. A lot of times people get that confused, and they they say to themselves, well, this is what Scripture says, but yeah, in the context of what it says, there's typically a condition. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good, and then people leave off to those who love God. To those who obey His commands, because if you obey my commandments, you love me. Those whose God's commands take precedent in their heart because they love God, He can take your life and He can work it all for good. But to just simply say this, God works all things for good, it's deceiving. It depends if you love him. If you're a disobedient son, no, your life's a wreck. Amen. It's just going to remain a wreck. And he can't, he can take le- lemons and turn it into champagne, right? But not, not, if, not if you don't love him. Not if his commands don't take precedent in your life. If your feelings come first, it's going to be very hard for him to do anything. Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And so I hear, God, I hear people say, well, God will just take care of my needs. Well, that's, that's interesting. If you're seeking him first, absolutely. He will. Go to the next slide. And you hear people say, well, he'll give you the desires of your heart, but you need to delight yourself in the Lord, not your feelings. Because you can delight in depression. I did it. It becomes a familiar friend. You get used to it. It feels weird if you don't have it. In John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. That should probably be one of the most sobering verses on your top 10 list. If you abide in me, you don't abide in him because you said a prayer. I can just be honest. You didn't say a salvation prayer, now all of a sudden you're abiding in him for the rest of your life. If that was the case, this verse would happen whenever you said a prayer. And so I, I, I challenge you to ask yourself, what does it actually mean to abide in him? What does it actually look like to abide in him? And then are you abiding in him? And what does it look like for him to abide in you? I bet you there'd be a passion there. I bet you there'd be a zeal around obeying him, not just by, his, by the word that you have in the Bible, but also by the word that he's telling you by the Spirit. So if I could offer to you guys something a little bit more tempting than depression, this is what I would say. How would you like to edify the people around you, build them up based on the right time and the right things to say? Would that be cool? That'd be a cool life. How would you like your prayers to be answered? Cool life? That's a cool life. But there's, that's, a, that's a journey. That's a journey in muzzling that mouth with the Holy Spirit, asking him to show you. You know what we don't say anymore? Because we downplayed it real hard. And there's a lot of theology out there saying, you know, you don't need to ask for forgiveness of sins because you are forgiven. Do you know why you need to ask? It's not because he, it's not on his checklist as if he didn't see it. It's because you don't even realize it after a while you're doing it. And the Holy Spirit wants to lead you and guide you into looking more like him. The Bible says this, if you know what to do and don't do it, it's a sin. I, I tell these people in Kyo groups all the time, if you've challenged yourself in Kyo to do something good for somebody else, and you don't do it, confess it so it stays on the radar. If you say you're going to pray for the sick in public and you're not doing it, confess it. And say, you know what, I said this, and and I'm not doing it, and I said I would, and I'm saying it because I I don't want to become numb to it. A lot of unwholesome things comes out of my mouth, and I'm I'm confessing it because I don't want to become numb to it. And I'm actually repenting because without repentance, there is no grace. Grace can't come and transform you unless you know what you need to be transformed into and from. Make sense? So unless we repent and confess, which is a posture of humility, he gives grace to the humble. But he opposes the proud. You know what's the worst? It's finding out that you've been opposed by God for five years because you were proud and you never humbled yourself and and there was this area in your life that just kept meeting opposition. And you never had breakthrough in because there was a, a lack of humility there. I'm not saying if you don't have breakthrough, it's because of lack of humility. What I'm saying is there's been things in my life where I refuse to let God speak and I refuse to repent and humble myself and I was actually opposed by God in that area. 
And I don't want that in my life. And I'm sure you guys don't want that in yours. And this is what the Lord's Prayer says. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us. There's something about perspective there. Number one, you're forgiven. How cool is that? Right? And he's saying, you know, you just, you just bring them, wipe them clean. Oh, and by the way, so is everybody else who sinned against you. If we were actually saying the Lord's Prayer every day, we'd probably have a different perspective about what's been done to us. Right? If we were in touch with what God's done in our life, we'd probably be in touch with the people around us, regardless of what they've done. Right? Amen? Amen? So it's a good place to ask for forgiveness. But in, we whipped against that because we're like, we're not, that's not our identity. We're not sinners anymore. Yes, I know. I know you're redeemed. But as a redeemed person, you're still growing. And the times I come up short, I want forgiveness for so that I can be empowered above those times. Make sense? Yeah. This guy's getting it. You got it. Everybody else is confused. <laughs> and this is what I want to do, if you guys don't mind. How many of you guys have ever got depression and you asked for prayer? You guys know what I mean? Here's the tricky thing. I'm not saying that we can't have breakthrough in prayer. What I'm saying is I can't pray away his arrows. He has permission to shoot, and you have permission to block. Can you guys catch me on that? Satan has permission to shoot arrows, and I can't pray his arrows away. What I'm trying to do is equip you to block so you can live unaffected by it. And so I was going to have people who suffered from it come up here, but see, here's the problem. You could come up here right? And then arrows could hit you out there and you could say the prayer didn't work. It's not about the prayer. It's about standing firm, standing fast in the midst of every kind of arrow that's being shot. Make sense? So why don't you just stand up for me? And because this is really, the word said it and the Holy Spirit will help us, but I just, just, I'm not trying to self-promote either. I just spent two, two sermons talking about depression. How many of you guys know anybody who suffers from depression? This, this stuff is on YouTube now. You know what I mean? It's, it's not hard to, to just, just give a platform to it or just say, hey, my, my pastor talked on depression. Do you want to watch these two, two videos? And then and, and let's just talk about them. And come alongside that person and really help them. Because it's supposed to be a house of restoration but it's going to be a, a restoration that you bring to the people that you've been put into your flock that you're supposed to take care of. And this is a start to something. If you're, if you're here and, and, and you, and you um, maybe suffer from depression, I, I, hope you, I hope you heard me with the right heart. I hope you're not offended. Um, because uh, I definitely went through it, and I wish somebody would have talked to me like this when I was in it. So why don't you just guys go ahead and extend your hand, and maybe if there's someone who you know who you want to want to introduce this to, or at least go and help them, just just lift them up in prayer. But I'm just going to pray for every person in here, Father. We don't want to be be a a a group of people who are led around by our feelings. We want to believe your word like obedient children. There's nothing cooler or more f- filled with faith than when your children believe you in the face of a world that is screaming the opposite. You love that. It pleases you. And we love those opportunities. God, and it, for some of us in here, man, we blew it. And, and, and I'm not asking for that opportunity to come back today. But Lord, man, when, if it ever comes back again, we'll be ready. We'll be ready to stand firm against all those things. And I thank you that I'm not my thoughts and feelings. I am what you say I am. I have been made holy, pure, and blameless, and righteous in your sight. And that's who I am. Forgive me for all the times I lost sight of that. Forgive me for the times where I bought into something else and I, and I played the part of something else instead of who you created me to be. And help me, there's, there's a place where I just don't even fully believe it yet, 
because my life doesn't reflect it. We want to grow, God. We want to grow into that. Holy Spirit, we just humble ourselves right now. Will you just come and empower us to live that more? And, and you work with all these individuals in here. I ask that with every individual that's in here, that you would show them what, what's next up as far as believing. The next scripture verse, God. The next thing that you want them to tackle in their lives to look more like you. Thank you for the journey, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bless